Okay, please look down in your notes. We are on our sixth lecture in Old Testament survey. And if you look on our board here, it says Israel's law and the order of biblical worship. Now, we are studying the book of Exodus right now, and I want to remind you that this study is a survey. It's not an exposition of the book, so I won't be going verse by verse through the book. But what I'm wanting to do is I'm wanting to give you tools that will help you as you go verse by verse through the book. I want to address certain ideas, certain concepts that are very important in our study of the book so that as you go verse by verse and as you read it, these little uh, things will be a help to you. Um, <clears throat> we've already gone through the book of Genesis, and when we went through the book of Genesis, we looked at the structure. Does anyone remember the structure of the book of Genesis was ten types of stories. What kinds of stories were they? Does anyone remember? It starts with an O. Ten stories about something. Anyone remember? Does the word origin... Huh? Origin. Does the word origin bring, bring remembrance to you? Okay? So what we see is in the book of Genesis we have ten different... I believe it was ten. I could be wrong on that. But we have individual origin stories. So uh, where did Abraham come from? Where did Isaac's descendants come from? Where did the creation come from? Where did man come from? We have these kinds of origin stories. And these things are to lay a foundation so that as we uh, study the Bible, we understand what's going on. And specifically, it's for the nation of Israel. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. And as they go into the promised land, they need to know about their history. And so that's what the book of Genesis was about. Now, we went through the book of Genesis, and we focused on one covenant. Does anyone remember what covenant we focused on in the book of Genesis? Right. Abrahamic covenant. Why is Abrahamic covenant so important? Yes, okay. He's going to redeem man through the Abrahamic covenant. Okay? So that's why we spent so much time on that. It's a very, very important topic. When we talk about the book of Exodus, we won't be discussing the Abrahamic covenant very much, but we'll be discussing a second covenant. What covenant do you think this one is? Yes, very good, the Mosaic covenant. So with that in mind, let's begin with a purpose statement for the book of Exodus. This is a purpose statement that I received when I was in seminary. Here's what it says. Exodus records the deliverance from Egyptian bondage and the giving of the law in order to show that the nation, or excuse me, to show the nation how they were formed into a nation and established under the theocratic rule of God as a mediatorial people so that they would see the beginning of the fulfillment of the promises made to the patriarchs. Now let me explain some terms in here because there might be some words that you're not very familiar with. First of all, notice the word deliverance. The book of Exodus is about God delivering his people out of Egyptian bondage. Now the question is, why were they in Egypt? How did they get there? Does anyone remember the story? Maybe just one or two details. What person's name? Joseph, okay? So Joseph is the key figure into how they got into Egypt. Joseph was sold as a slave by his brothers who hated him. He ends up in Egypt, and through the course of God's work, providence, we're talking about God's sovereignty and, and the, the providential working of God. Through God's providential working, Joseph ends up in a position where God uses him to actually preserve the life of his family. And he invites them to come and to stay with him in Egypt. And that's how they end up in Egypt. But what we see is that over time, there was a new king in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. And he sees this group of people that are living amongst the Egyptians. And he's scared because they're, they're being blessed. They're growing as a nation. They're, they're having large families. They're becoming very powerful. They're, uh, they're being blessed in a lot of ways. And so... He begins to fear that if this people becomes too strong, they're going to conquer our own people. That was what he was afraid of. So what he did is he put them in bondage. He made them slaves in Egypt. 
when they had initially been in Egypt really in a very honored position. So that's a whole other story. If we read through Genesis and Exodus, we'll see that there. But I want to mention that. And then notice it talks about giving the law. We're going to talk about the law of Moses. This is a very, very important topic. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the law. We're not going to so much look at individual laws, but we're going to look at some basic approaches to understanding how to interpret those laws found within the Mosaic law. And then the purpose of this was to show the nation that they were formed as a nation by God for a purpose, a very important purpose. Notice the word theocratic rule. What is a democracy? A democracy is the rule by what? The people. Okay? We vote in our leaders. That's what a democracy is. Ghana is a democracy. You have elections. Well, we, we have another form of government called a theocracy. A theocracy means that God is the ruler of the nation. So God is the king. God is the one who establishes the laws. And those people that he providentially puts in authority are supposed to hold his laws in high regard. They're supposed to keep justice in the land. So Israel is a very unique nation. Israel's not functioning this way today. Israel's functioning as a democracy, technically. But in those days, initially, Israel was a theocracy. God was their king. Even when God establishes Saul and David and Solomon as kings, I know uh, Brother Winston has, has read this. There was a passage that says, when you have a king, he is supposed to write his own copy of the law so that he has that. Why? Because as the king, can't he make his own laws? Well, in Israel, the answer is no. God's law, the Mosaic law, is the law of the land. It's like their constitution. And so we need to keep this in mind. God is ultimately supposed to be the ruler of Israel. Unfortunately, the people did not live with God as their king. They didn't always honor him. In fact, their history is, is, is complete failure, honestly. We see this over and over and over again. And then we see this word, a mediatorial people. The word mediator is what we have there. A mediator is a go-between. Now, we understand in the traditional culture, you have, you have a person who is a chief, and then the chief has the linguist. And the, the linguist is the mediator. He goes between the chief and the common person who comes to greet the chief. And so this mediator goes back and forth, back and forth. He brings you into the chief's presence. That's what Israel was supposed to be. Israel was supposed to be a group of people that God sets apart so that through them, he's going to reach out to all nations of the world. God's plan was not for the world to just be a Jewish world or a world where only God's people were Jewish and the Gentiles were all pagans. That wasn't God's, that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was for the Jews to be a light to the Gentiles. And through them, they were supposed to be a kingdom of priests. So we see all these things, and then at the end we see that God's going to begin to fulfill his promises made to the patriarchs. Now you think about it. If you're a group of people who God's made promises to your ancestors, and now you're slaves, you're not thinking that God's really following through with his promise, are you? I wouldn't be thinking that. Oh, so God makes these promises to Abraham, blessing him and cursing people who curse us. And What are we doing? We're slaves. We, 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 can't e we can't even own our own property and homes. We answer to other people. This is not right. And so what is God going to do? He's going to show them that, look, I haven't forgotten you. I am going to follow through with what I promised you I will do. So all of these concepts are found in this purpose statement. And I hope that, that you will, you'll, you'll study this purpose statement and you'll understand what the book of Exodus is about. It's about God delivering people out of bondage. It's about him establishing a law. It's about him es establishing a nation. It's about him establishing a form of rule, being a theocracy, where God is the one who rules. It's about God's people being mediators between God and the rest of the world. They're supposed to be a kingdom of priests. 
And it's about God fulfilling his promises that he made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So this is our purpose statement. The next thing I'd like us to look at are three important features of the book of Exodus. I won't spend a lot of time on these things, but I want to mention them briefly. The first is it's about God delivering Israel out of Egypt. Why is Israel in Egypt? Why do they need to be delivered? Well, the book answers that question. Two, God establishes a covenant with Israel. Now, God's already established a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham's not a nation. Jacob's not a nation. It's called a family at that point. But now the family, over a 400-year period of time, has become strong. We're now not talking about a group of 12 brothers or a group of 100 people. We're talking about thousands of people. In fact, some would even say that when they left Egypt, the group was probably over a million people. Now, they weren't all Jews. There was a mixed group. There were actually Egyptians there as well who went with the nation of Israel because they believed that Israel's God was the one true God. It's an interesting thing that it's important for us to recognize that, and that will come up throughout uh, the, the portions of, the, of, the, um, of the, the Pentateuch that give us the history of Israel. We, we hear this mixed multitude. What does that mean? It means that we have... Jews and we have Gentiles a part of the same group. But it's about God establishing a, 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 second, a secondary covenant. And that covenant is going to be the Mosaic Law. And it's going to show that Israel will have a unique relationship with God. They will be his people. And he will explain how they'll be governed as a nation. It's about God giving instruction regarding the tabernacle. Mr. Biney, what is the tabernacle? Yes, very good. The tabernacle was a tent. And the temple was actually built after the pattern of the tabernacle. Okay? And that is where they worshipped and that is where God's presence met with them. Now, we believe that God is all present. He is everywhere. Okay? So, God is with us. God is with people in America. He's with people in China all at the same time. But what we have is in the tabernacle, we have God's glory. We have a, a manifestation of God's glory, His presence, right there in the tabernacle. It's actually going to be in a specific location. It is in that place where God is actually going to reveal Himself. He's going to speak to Moses and to Aaron. Okay, We're going to have actually times where there's actually a conversation. Very, very interesting. And so the tabernacle is an important place. And God is going to give very specific details on the size of the tabernacle, the materials that were used in the tabernacle. God is very particular about what he wants there. And he actually gives a pattern to Moses for Moses to actually make. I believe it has the idea of there was actually like a small tabernacle that he gave to him to say, here's what it's to look like. Here's the instruction. Now go and build it. That's the idea. So these are three very important features that we find in the book. The question is, who wrote the book? Well, we've already made uh, a lot of, we've, we've talked a lot about who wrote the Pentateuch. We know this is part of the Pentateuch, so the answer is Moses. And the question is, when did he write it? The, the date that I'm going to ask you to remember is 1440 BC. 1440 BC. I could ask that on a test. So, so note on that, please. And by the way, the test is next week. <laughs> Which one? All of the classes are next week. All of the classes. So there's one on Monday and Thursday. And Thursday, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Hey, so 1440 BC. And by the way, there is discussion about whether or not there's a, a later date, 1220. But 1440 is the one that, um, that I, I believe it is. But yes. Okay, so... Um, was it as a result of uh, Joseph's ending being sold to slavery that brought about all these people that ended up in uh, Egypt or the Africa I mean, Was well, it like the first descendant that yeah. ended up in, uh, in uh, well, Egypt? Okay, the way, the way that it happened was when, when Joseph sold into slavery, 
obviously we know the story about him going to Potiphar's household and then he's in prison and then he, he's able to, uh, to tell a dream well interpret, he's able to interpret the Pharaoh's dream okay and when he does that the Pharaoh recognizes that this man is a prophet this man has received revelation from God and that's he's a very wise man so he understood that and so he elevated Joseph he made him second in command of the whole nation and during that time uh, God revealed to the Pharaoh through Joseph that he was going to send seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine and during the seven years of plenty the wisest thing to do would be not to just waste it all but to store it up so that when you go through the seven years of famine you have food stored up that you can give to the people and so that's what they did and and so because of how serious the famine was and it was not just in egypt but it was it was it was beyond those local areas as even into into, into the area of palestine jacob's family was running out of food and they had a lot of animals and you know how are we going to feed these animals how are we going to feed ourselves and they heard that there was food in Egypt. So he sends his sons down to Egypt. And that's where they meet Joseph. And that's where the, the interaction begins. And Joseph, you know, I'm condensing the story, but Joseph reveals himself to be their, their brother, the one that they sold into slavery. He forgives them. And then he says, please bring my father back so I can see him. Okay. And that, that's how they end up there. Yeah. Yes. So two questions. <clears throat> Who, what do you see? Is it the family of Ishmael? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, the, the uh, I think it was the Midianites. I'm, I'm, I, I have to look back at the Yeah, please, at please the pass it. For me. Yeah, I have to, I have to go back to that. But, the, but it was, it was, they were the cousins. Mm -hmm. Okay. These were cousins. So. Right. So, so they were relatives. They were rel well. I have to. I have to look back at it, and I'll. I'll come back to that. Let's not do it right now, so we can continue. But and, and, and the question is: Is it a punishment that God gave to Israelites that they were sold in a slave? That they ended up. Yeah, yeah. For them to end up, I, I it. No, that was not. That was not a punishment. punishment. No, it wasn't. Um, actually, we don't really have explanation as to why. Too much. What we do know, though, is that God told Abraham in Genesis 15 that that would happen. And we can make a lot of assumptions like, was God being hard on them because of the way they treated their brother? You know, what was going on? I, I, I would kind of lean, lean towards the idea that God was taking them out of Canaan because Canaan was a very, we could say, a, very, a lot of idolatry, a lot of, a lot of evil. And those, those cultures were so evil that God was separating his people from that, those cultures. He's going to judge them. And we, we see how, how evil, how wicked those cultures were when we see the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So, once again, can we say that uh, God knew that Egyptians uh, are not true worshippers. And once again, he wants them to know the true God. I mean, can, can we say that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. God, God wanted the, the Egyptians to know him. Mm, yeah. And so it, they were idol worshippers just like uh, the Canaanites were. But if, if, you, if you pick up a book that talks about ancient Near Eastern history mm. and you start reading about what the Canaanites did, what, what, what they've discovered through archaeology, those kinds of things, you'll find out that they were a pretty nasty group of people. Mm. Um, they they sacrifice children, um, all kinds of immorality, sleeping with animals, homosexuality was very common. Uh, they had homosexual prostitutes. It was part of their religious practice. They, they were they were a very immoral, a very uh, strong idol worshiping society, and they were very fierce. So um, God is separating them out. There's no doubt that he did that. But w there's nothing in Scripture that says, I put you in Egypt to punish you or anything like that. The truth is that, that is, it, it, is, it is sometimes in suffering that a group of people receive their identity. 
I mean, I know that's sad, but that is true. That is where they became strong. That's where they became unified. And um, God's going to establish them as a nation, and then they're going to go back to Canaan. And they will... And, and, and essentially, it's not that they went and took Canaan. It's that God gave them Canaan. That's the way that the Scripture presents it as. God says, this, is, this land will belong to you. I'm giving it to you. And if you are not faithful in this land, I will remove you from it. And I will, I will allow you to be conquered. And when the Babylonians and the Syrians came in, that was clearly judgment from God. There's no doubt about that. And we do see a lot of times where the prophets say, if you do this, or if you continue to do this, if you don't stop doing this, God's going to punish you. And this is how he'll do it. And we see that a lot. But we don't see that in this passage. Okay. So we have who wrote it. We have the dates. Let's continue. What history is covered in the book? And I think this is very interesting. From the death of Joseph to the establishing of the covenant. That's the Mosaic covenant where God gives the law at Mount Sinai. That's the, that's the time period that's being covered, okay? So the death of Joseph to the Exodus is around 400 years. Now, we don't get a lot of information in those 400 years. We're focusing on the last, the last 40, well, really the last 80 years of that because we have the, the birth of Moses. Moses is 40 years old. Moses ends up... Uh, Basically, he kills someone. Uh, he's basically he goes back to the uh, to the Israelites, and he wants to identify with his own people. And he kills an Egyptian who is fighting with a Hebrew, who is abusing a Hebrew. And when he finds out that people know about this, he runs for his life, and he ends up on the backside of the desert, and he stays there for forty years. So we're talking about you know the last eighty years of Israel's time in Egypt. That's what we have during uh, the beginning of the book of Exodus. And then we have the plagues and all those things leading up to them ending up at Mount Sinai. And I do want to make this point. From Exodus 19 to Numbers chapter 2, that whole portion of Scripture is dealing with a 13-month period of time. So we're talking about just over a year. And you say, well, what was going on in those 13 months? They were at Mount Sinai. God was giving them the law. God was teaching them the law. That's what's going on while they're at Mount Sinai. So they were camped there for, for quite a while before they picked up and went to the next location. Okay? We also see that at Mount Sinai, this is where God's people learn about the covenant that God's establishing with them. <coughs> I mentioned this earlier, but they leave Egypt as a mixed multitude. What I mean by that is they're not just Jews... But there are also Egyptians. And actually a lot of people, I believe it's uh, the, uh, the Wood book, Israel's History. That's a very, very interesting book. I have two copies there. Very, very interesting book because it goes through a lot of history. He would say that during the time of the Exodus, the Egyptians were not being ruled by an Egyptian leader, but by another group from the outside called the Hyksos. I don't think I probably said that correct. So it was actually the Egyptians being ruled by another group of people. And so we have several ethnic groups that are moving with the Israelites. And it's all based on what they saw in the plagues. The plagues were meant to judge the Egyptians for what they did. They were meant to reveal to the Egyptians that Israel's God is the supreme God. The, the plagues were meant to be specific attacks on specific idols that were being worshipped in Egypt. Very interesting. The Nile River was worshipped. So what does God do? He turns it into blood. The sun was worshipped. What does God do? Makes it dark. <laughs> okay? Just to, they worship the frogs. So what does God do? He puts so many frogs in there that people are stepping on frogs. Frogs are everywhere. And then he kills all the frogs. And the, the whole place stinks. They're being defiled by their gods. Okay? <laughs> So what's the point? God is making a, a very strong point. One of the things that we have to understand is in the Old Testament, he's making points in ways that their culture understood. For instance, we look and we go, man, Israel went in and they just like annihilated people. What's the deal with that? I mean, that really sounds awful. And, 
and, and, and it is. And, and, fr- and frankly, it's something that, you know, even as a strong Christian, sometimes I look back and I go, I have a hard time with that. But we have to keep in mind, number one, it wasn't so much that the Israelites were doing the, the, the work. It was that God did it. We see several examples of God miraculously. I mean, the Egyptians being drowned in the Red Sea. Did Moses do that? No, God did it. Okay? God's making a point. And one of the things that, that would happen is when they went to war, people believed that their gods, that they worship, their idols, whichever group triumphed, it was their God that gave them that deliverance. And so when, when Israel's God says, I give you the deliverance, and he does it through miraculous means, what he's doing is showing that I am the true God. These are just idols. These are worthless things. Do not serve them. He's saying that to Israel. He's saying that to these Gentile nations as well. So these are some things on the background. We also have to know that the Israelites didn't all know their history. I mean, the book of Genesis and Exodus is about their history as a nation. Why? Well, they didn't really know it. A lot of them did not know their history. And part of that was because they were living in a foreign land. They were separated from the land that their forefathers were living in. And they were slaves in that land. And so a lot of them didn't know their history. And so what, what God is doing is he's, he's through Moses giving them their history. And some of them probably didn't even know Hebrew. You know, the, the Egyptians were not Hebrew speakers. And so uh, we, we have all these things going on during that time period. Let me give you a few major truths, or a few, uh, let me uh, give you five important truths that are developed in this book, okay? And these are, are important applications, that when we read the book, we see these things. The first thing is that Egypt was oppressive to the Jews. They were in Egypt for nearly 400 years, and they were enslaved for a large portion of that time. Now, you might go, why is that important for us to understand? We have these prosperity teachers that say if you're God's child, you'll never experience hardship. Well, that's not true. We see so many examples of this in the Bible. God was not allowing them to be oppressed in Egypt because he hated them, or because he forgot about them, or because he was unable to to actually deliver them or give them strength. We, we, we clearly are going to see God's power when he delivers them out of Egypt. But what's the point? God has purposes in those things. Some purposes that we don't fully understand even to this day. And some purposes that clearly these people did not understand at the time. But God has purposes in those things. And so we see even as God reflects on the covenant that he has with, e- with uh, Abraham and his descendants... It's, that, it's as if God feels the pain of, of, of the Israelites. They're his people. He loves them. And, and there's an important application there. The second thing is this. God miraculously provides deliverance for his people through Moses. God raises up a deliverer. And, and this is one of the things that, that we, we have to rest in. And that's the fact that God is sovereign. God rules. As we go through hard times... We have to recognize that they're there. But we also have to recognize that God is completely able, if he chooses or when he chooses, to deliver us from those things. Okay? He raises up Moses. Moses is a very unlikely guy. He seems likely initially, but then he ends up as a shepherd in the desert. It's like he's abandoned his people. He doesn't know the faith of his people. What's he doing? He's just kind of living a pretty obscure life. And what does God do? God raises him up out of obscurity, brings him back, and he becomes one of the most influential figures in Israel's history. Even to this day, the Jews will talk about Moses. Who do they think of? Moses, David, Solomon. Those are three key figures. Daniel would be another one in Israel's history. Yet he was just a shepherd, and God raises him up. We have God's people receiving the book of the covenant, which includes the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. The book of the covenant is talking about, well, we'll talk about covenants in just a little bit, but it's talking about 
who God is calling out, why he's calling them out, the conditions of their covenant, what will happen if they do right, what will happen if they do wrong, the laws of their land. We have all these things in this book called the Book of the Covenant. We also have God establishing the only appropriate way to worship him. As he gives instruction to them regarding the tabernacle, the priesthood, the sacrificial system, and festival seasons. Now this is important. Sometimes people will say that every religion believes in God. And since we all believe in a supreme being, while we have different ways of approaching him, while we might have different concepts of him, generally speaking, we all believe in God. And if there's really only one true God, then we all believe in Him. And so we've all got our individual roads, but you know, all roads lead to Rome. That's kind of the, the approach that people will take. So there's like the Muslim way, there's like the Buddhist way, there's the Hindu way, there's the Christian way. There's the traditional religion way. All that's important is that you believe in God. That's what a lot of people will say. But we don't get that idea reading the book of Exodus. Reading the book of Exodus, we see that God's very particular about how you come to him. You can't just come to him any way that you want. There's a very specific, prescribed way. He didn't say, Moses, build whatever you want. You just build a tent and that will be the place we worship. No, he says, here's the tabernacle. Here's the exact dimensions. He doesn't say, okay, anybody can be a priest. The women can be priests. People from Judah can be priests. People from Benjamin can be... He says, no. The only people that can be priests are Levites. You say, ah, that's not fair. It's what God said. What if somebody wanted to be a priest from Benjamin? Well, he can't be. What if someone's a woman and wants to be a priest? Well, she can't be. What if someone had a physical deformity? Couldn't be a priest. Why is that? God gives very specific instruction regarding that the sacrificial system there are very specific details on how they were to do sacrifice to god they didn't sacrifice pigs in the tabernacle they couldn't even eat pigs <laughs> according to their law god is very precise and then they had festival seasons and so during certain seasons they would have this feast and another season they'd have another feast and so we see these things. The point is this. When God establishes the nation as his nation, he's very particular about how they are to approach him. And this carries on into the New Testament. While in the New Testament, we don't have a sacrificial system, a priesthood, a tabernacle, and all those things. The Bible doesn't say if you're going to build a church building, you have to have this dimension. You have, he doesn't. We don't have that. But what the Bible does say is, if someone's going to be a pastor, he has to be a one-woman man. He has to have a certain kind of character. By the way, it can't be a woman. Has to be able to defend sound doctrine. We have all these specific things. We have deacons in the scriptures. We have certain things that were the practice of the early church. And so there still are specific things that we see in the New Testament that are related to the worship of God. And so we see these, these elements in the book. Very, very important. The last thing that I will mention here is that God continues to emphasize that mankind is fallen. That his nature is broken. When we see Israel's history, we do not see a great group of people who are really faithful, really obedient, really trusting God. We see people who sinned. We see people that that had more revelation about God than any other people in, 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 in human history. Yet what do they do? They go through the Red Sea. They're delivered from the, uh, through the Red Sea. They see God give them great, great victories. They go to Mount Sinai, and there at Mount Sinai they receive the law, and they're trembling because they see the fire of God on this mountain, and it's shaking, and they can hear God's voice booming. Yeah, we can't even imagine this. Actually, we can imagine it. It's kind of a terrifying thought. It'd be a fascinating movie. Mount Sinai. Okay? But what happens? Moses goes up there for 40 days. And when he comes down, 
the people are involved in idol worship. Even his own brother is involved in idol worship. They're singing, they're dancing, they create a golden calf. And, and Aaron says, these are the gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. We're like, what? By the way, this is one of the great, I think, testimonies to the fact that the Bible is God's word, not just man's word. You, you think about it. When you write a book about your life, are you going to write about your like greatest failures? <laughs> are you going to like bear your soul on your secret sins? <laughs> the areas where you've struggled, the times you've done wrong? No. You're going to conveniently like leave those out. If someone writes a book about you, then they're going to be really gracious unless they really hated you. <laughs> and despise you and want your name to be terrible, they're going to really respect you. When we go to a funeral, yeah, think about it. At a funeral, you could have a guy that committed adultery constantly. He has a wife, and he has ten children with six different women. Yet what will they say at his funeral? Will they say, this guy was an immoral, worldly, disrespectful, unfaithful man. No, they won't say that. They'll say, he was kind. He was gentle. He was faithful. A loving father. A patient husband. And everyone's like, yeah, that's true. But everybody knows that's not true. What am I trying to say? If you're writing a book about your history, you don't write negative things. <laughs> you, you, you know, I, sometimes I, I sit down and I go, what would it be like to sit in the history class of, say, a German history class when they talk about World War II? You know, I, I think about that. Do they talk about the Holocaust? If they do, what do they say? I mean, as a nation, that's an embarrassment. I think about my own, my own country when we talk about the, uh, the slave trade. There are some classes, history teachers, that won't really talk about that very much. They won't. You know why? Because it's a very embarrassing part of our nation's history. It's a terrible thing. Sometimes you have to go to an outside source to get some of this information. You say, well, what's my point? My point is this. The Bible speaks the truth about human nature. When Israel was unfaithful, it says, boom, here's what they did. The greatest heroes in Israel's history, it, it, it records their faults. David's sin with Bathsheba is in the Bible. In fact, it's a glaring part of the life of David. There are very few people in the Bible that we don't have negative about them. There are very few. I think of Daniel and maybe Joseph. But even Joseph, we have, when he's talking to his brothers, he seemed to be kind of proud. Very few examples. And this is because humans sin. And these things are really emphasized in the book. I'd like to make two more points, and uh, then I think we'll probably draw this lesson to a close. Um, and we'll, we'll do this in two parts, because the second part is dealing with Israel's legal system. And I want you to understand this, because when we talk about the Mosaic Law, when we read those Old Testament laws, we need to understand that these laws are not written the way that our laws are written today. If we were to go, and I, I, I don't know uh, how this is in, in Ghana versus the United States. I can't say. But what I'll say is this. If you went into a legal library to study the laws that are in American culture, you would have an entire library full of books with exhaustive laws that are very detailed. And the reason for that is because the law is meant to cover every potential issue that could be there. When someone is arguing a court case and 
a person is a defense attorney and they know that the person they're defending is guilty, their job is not to prove that he's innocent. It's to find a loophole in the laws that are being brought against this man, the charges being brought against him. It's to, it's, it's to prove loopholes so that the guy gets off. That's really what it's all about. But what we're going to find out is that when we look at the laws in the Scripture, it's different. 600 laws sounds like a lot. But when you realize that that's the law of a, of a nation, 600 laws is not a lot. Frankly, it's not. Especially when you realize that these laws are not long laws, but they're very simple. Very short statements. So we're going to explain that next week. But two very interesting cultural observations. And these are things that I did not know until I was actually studying for this lecture. And when I, when I was exposed to this, I thought, this is very interesting. I never noticed this before. You know, there are certain things in, in Ghanaian culture that as an American, I don't pick. The way that maybe you express things sometimes. There are things in American, English, uh, American culture. And sometimes when we sit down and have a conversation or if we're involved, say like in a wedding. I was kind of nervous about the wedding. And one of the reasons is because, see, you don't know what cultural customs I have, have have in my culture that are different than yours you don't know them it's like you don't know my culture and I'm learning your culture and so there might be something that I do that seems very natural to me that could actually be very offensive here and at a wedding you don't want to do that maybe I did something like that I don't know I hope I didn't okay but but the idea is that I tried to ask some questions like Mr. Biney I said Mr. Biney are there any things that I need to kind of know about before I go into this? <laughs> Some things that I shouldn't say, things I shouldn't do. Why is that? Because I don't know this culture. Well, we need to understand when we read the Bible, we are reading it from the culture of Israel. There are certain things that are said that because of our culture being removed from theirs, we miss them. And there are actually some really neat little truths there. I want to just give you two, give you some examples. The first one is this. When someone repeats a person's name, when they're directly addressing them, it is an expression of endearment. It would be like this. Stephen walks in and I say, Stephen, Stephen, you're welcome. Now, if I did that, you'd be like, Pastor, you only needed to say my name once. Stephen, you are welcome. But let me show you some examples in the, in the, in the Bible. <clears throat> or let me just re re read them. In Exodus chapter 3, when the Lord saw Moses, Moses turned aside and, and God called unto him from the midst of the bush and he said, Moses, Moses. Why did he do it that way? Let me give you another example. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 10, the Lord came and stood and called out, to Samuel, and this is what he said, Samuel, Samuel. First Samuel chapter, Second Samuel chapter 18, verse 33. The king was moved, went to his chamber over the gate and wept. And when he did this, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Why are they repeating the name of the people that they're talking to or about. Why? Here's the reason. This is a way that they express endearment to a person. So if I went to Mr. Biney and I said, Mr. Biney, Mr. Biney, how are you? If we were Jews at this time, Mr. Biney would know that what I'm telling him is that I feel this affection for him like he is my dear brother. Like he is family. He is my closest of friends. Do you understand what I'm saying here? So when, 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 when God speaks to Moses and he says, Moses, Moses. For Moses, it was God is not just speaking to me like this distant person. But he speaks to me as if I'm his dear friend. It's 
kind of significant, isn't it? When he calls out to Samuel, here's this little kid. And he says, Samuel, Samuel. He's, he's, he's showing endearment. When, when David talks about Absalom and he says his name several times, he's saying, I loved my son. That's what he's expressing. But, but let me give you two examples that I think are very significant. They're New Testament examples. But they're built on this idea. In Luke 6, Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? Or in Matthew, Jesus says, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not done these things in your name? This is what Jesus is saying. You will talk to me as if you truly love me. As if we are the dearest of friends and you are going to be separated from me. And you think about that. That passage kind of brings a little bit more weight to it, doesn't it? That there will be people who really believe they love the Lord, that they are like close to Him, who are going to be cast away from Him for eternity. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, I think of a lot of these charismatic churches. People who you, you go to give the gospel to them, and they're like, look, man, I don't need to talk about this. I know God. We're close. I love him. I'm passionate about him. And they tell you all these things. Here's what I do for God. Yet in their heart, salvation is not about what Christ did. It's about what they do for God. Do you see what he's saying? But listen to this example. Luke 9, Acts 9, verse 4. Paul fell on his face to the earth, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? You think about this. Here is Paul. Saul is his Jewish name. He's going to persecute Christians. He's going to drag them out of their homes and take them back to Jerusalem. Cast them in prison. And when Christ meets him on the road to Damascus, he comes to him as his friend. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? That's pretty powerful. That's really, really powerful. The second cultural observation that I want to mention is this. When someone is presented with a high honor, people often understate their position by expressing how humble and lowly they are. And it's a sign of respect. Let me give you some examples. When God comes to Abraham in Genesis 18, Abraham says to him, Behold, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. I am but dust and ashes. I'm dust and ashes. Now, is that really true? Well, I mean, he's a person. He's, he's, he's received a high honor by God. He's speaking face to face with God. Not face to face, but he's talking to the Lord. Yet he says, I'm dust and ashes. Another example in Exodus 4, when Moses, God comes to Moses and says, you need to come. You're going to take my people out of Egypt. Moses goes, I'm not eloquent. I, I cannot speak. I'm slow of speech. I have a slow tongue. Now, listen. Moses, the Bible says, was mighty in words. It says this in Hebrews. He was very educated. There is a sense in which he's making excuse, but it's also a sense of, he's like he's lowering himself, saying, I'm not worthy for this situation. We have Saul. When, when he is anointed to be the next king by Samuel, he says, I am a Benjamite, the smallest of the tribes of Israel. I'm the least of the families of the tribe. He's saying, I'm a little guy. I'm nothing. We have another, this is interesting. When David is being pursued by, by Saul, he comes out and he says, why do you pursue me? I'm a dead dog. It's like you're pursuing a flea. Is David a dead dog? Is he really a flea? The answer is no. He's a mighty warrior. He's a powerful guy. 
but he's humbling himself. We think of Isaiah who says, Woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. In the midst of a people of unclean lips. These are examples of people humbling themselves. And there is truth behind what they're saying. But what I'm saying is, we don't think this way. It would be like if, you know, I'm coming to visit Mr. Biney and I I come to his house and I bow down before him and I say, Mr. Biney, thank you so much for letting me come to your house. I'm a dead dog. I can't believe that you would let me into your house. He's like, really? He'd feel uncomfortable. But if we were living in that culture, someone would say, no, you're welcome. And it's a great honor. You see what I mean? We have two examples in the New Testament. We have David, or we have Paul. What does he say? Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. Was Paul the worst sinner in the world? <laughs> Somehow I doubt it. <laughs> I'm sure he wasn't a worse sinner than me. What a faithful guy. But he, he was humbling himself. We have in Ephesians chapter 3, where he says, Unto me, who am the least of all the saints, is given grace that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You see, Paul is a Jew. He thinks in a Hebrew way. And so he's expressing his humility. And so these are just a couple of things. As we read through our Old Testaments, we're going to see these examples and, and realize that, that these are not to be taken like David really believes he's a dog or he's a flea. Or how could he say that? Because he's a mighty man. But it's, it's somebody humbling themselves. Even when the angel comes to Mary, he says, you are highly favored among women. And she, and she says, you know, who am I? And she, she basically, she really humbles herself. We see this over and over in our, in, our, in our Hebrew Old Testament. So I wanted to give those observations as we look at the book of Exodus. Next week, we'll get into Israel's laws. We'll, we'll explain the two kinds of laws will explain Israel's justice system. We'll look at how we interpret the laws. And then we'll talk a little bit about the issue of the covenant, specifically the Mosaic covenant. So that's what we're going to cover. Uh, well, actually, next week we'll have our exam. So we won't cover that next week. It'll be the following week. <laughs> okay? So we'll go ahead and stop there.